So, uh, Stephanie. Hi, Doctor. Uh, hi, welcome. Okay, I'm gonna do some stuff. Okay, you just handle things here. Okay, and you okay. can admit you admit people now. Okay. 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 So I will play that again. <laughs> Buenos días, mucho gusto. Buenos días. Stephanie está allá. Perfecto. Hello, Avisha. Hello, hello, Professor. How are you? Fine, fine. So nice to see you. Nice to see you. Buenos días, amigos. Buenos días, doctor Salazar. ¿Cómo está? Un gusto tenerlo nuevamente. ¿Cómo ha pasado, Stephanie? Qué gusto.
Hi, Dr. Victor. Hi, Avila. How are you? How are you? Good. How are you doing? Dr. Shah, good morning. Nice good you. morning. Professor Victor. Good morning. Good morning. Hola, good morning. How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? How are Doctor Victor Hugo, buenos días. Qué gusto saludarle. Hola, profesor Jorge Salazar. ¿Cómo está? Bien, bien. Qué honor tenerle con nosotros. El honor es mío, profesor. ¿Qué tal las cosas de en, en México, profesor? Bien, bien. ¿Cómo ha pasado bien. por ahí? En cuanto a la enfermedad, bien, pues ya estamos en semáforo verde prácticamente en todo el país. Ah, qué bien, qué bien. O sea, bueno, sí han reducido los casos en tal caso. Sí, se ha reducido mucho la enfermedad. Entonces, vamos bien. Nada más ayer estos hechos lamentables del fútbol. A mí no me gusta el fútbol, pues casi no lo veo. Pero sí fue una situación muy lamentable. Claro. Claro, no, qué pena. Pero bueno, sí, esperemos que poco a poco no vayan saliendo y poco a poco también volvamos a la, a la presencialidad, ¿no? Sí, sí. Qué bueno, qué bien. Y con la eh, formación pues de todos estos eh, modelos que usted hace, ¿cómo sigue? Veo que cada vez están popularizándose más a nivel mundial, mucha gente está adquiriendo y tengo ya algunos comentarios que realmente les ha parecido fantástico. Entonces, ¿cuándo será que podemos adquirirlos por acá, por Ecuador? Ah, eh, pues, eh, eh, ¿van a ir al Congreso de Colombia? Sí, 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 seguro. Ah, pues allá, allá nos vamos a ver. Eh, sí, lo que yo los hago en, a escala uno a uno, ya llegó el profesor Atul Gol. Eh, platicamos en un rato para que lo sí. saluden al doctor Atul Gol. Profesor Atul, how are you? Hello, 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 John, hello, Bob. Hello, when, good morning. Professor Atul, George, how nice are you? Nice to see you. Welcome. Ah, great pleasure, great pleasure. How are you? Everything okay? Fine, fine. We're doing fine here. Are we going to meet in Colombia or no? Yes, yes. Okay. Are you going there? Yes, yes, I will oh, see you. Oh, wow, you're going, you're going all the way there. That's a long trip. Fantastic. <laughs> John, you'll be there or no? No, I'd like to be, but hopefully I'll televise some of it. But wow, that's a long trip at all. India yeah, to yeah. Colombia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be a little bit strong. Let us see. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So... Okay, Nicole, I'll just introduce, oh, you, you just introduced uh, Byron, oh, right? Okay. Okay, Byron. Hi, hi so gonna, Should she introduce you, Byron? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, oh, okay. no problem. Yeah, yeah, and then you run it, then you run it, essentially. Hey. Okay. Yes, Professor, okay. to, uh, of what you uh, wrote, wrote to me, there is no problem, you can have as much time as you need, okay. and if it's of, okay with you, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of the of the of the other conference, like a, just like an introduction for your talk. Uh, so it'll be like maybe twenty minutes, and then you can have all the time you want. Okay, if, if well, that's okay no, with you. No, no problem. Please go ahead. Okay, very good. Okay, here we go to call okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. nine eight seven six five four three two one. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hi from the student team of Neurosurgical TV, created and directed by Dr. John Bennett. We have the opportunity now to help the Equatorians Association of Neurosurgery in charge of Dr. Byron Salazar. Thank you all for being here. Dr. Byron, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. It's a pleasure for us to be here uh, with you in this day. And we have an interesting lecture uh, of a uh, craniocervical junction. We have a, an amazing uh, panelist, an expert, and master surgeon that has no need for any introduction, uh, Professor Tul Goyal. And also we have in this occasion, uh, Professor uh, Jorge Salazar. Uh, he is the neurosurgery in chief of the Metropolitan Hospital in Quito, Ecuador. 
and uh, he made his uh, residency program in Spain in the Puerta de Hierro Hospital. And as a past president of the of the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery, he uh, will be joining with us in this uh, lecture. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Dr. John Bennett and Neurosurgical TV for all the support, the, the SOPEN and the academic committee of the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery. Uh, please, Dr. Salazar, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be here joining great professor and master Atul Goel. Uh, thank you for the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery, John Bennett, and the sponsors of this program. Uh, I'm going to share my, my screen. Uh, can you see my slides? Perfect. The craniovertebral junction is a complex transitional region between the base of the skull of the upper cervical spine. It is formed by the occipital bone and the first two cervical vertebrae, C1, the atlas, C2, the axis. This region contains vital neural vascular visceral structures. So a clear anatomical knowledge, it is necessary to perform a safe surgical access, preserving its biomechanical properties and stability. A complete description of the anatomical and neurosurgical techniques is beyond the object of this presentation. Classical publications made by the giants and masters of spine surgery like Professor Atul Goel and many others can be found uh, references uh, uh, elsewhere. I tend to present some key points and nuances to keep in mind when approaching the CB junction. I hope mainly this will be helpful for medical students, residents, and young neurosurgeons. Regarding the CB embryology, you know that congenital anomalies may occur between the fourth and then seven weeks of intrauterine life because failure of segmentation, fusion, and hypoplexia. Malformations of the occipital bone, like vasillary imagination, condylar hypoplasia, atlas assimilation are common. The rostral segment of the proatlas is fused to the occipital condyle forming the condyles. The caudal proatlas is incorporated into the atlas, forming its rostral articulation facets and a portion of the lateral mass. The proatlas centrum turns into the apical ligament of the dens. The atlas originates in the fourth occipital and first cervical sclerotomes. The anosified tissue of proatlas forms DLR and transverse ligament. Acquired diseases can be caused by trauma, lacking acute ligamentose and bony injury, chronic as in osodontoidium, inflammations like in rheumatoid arthritis, infections such as in Grisel syndrome, metabolic like in Morcus syndrome, and from benign and malignant tumors. To treat these complex pathologies, it still remains a challenge whichever route is chosen, because an intricate combination of neurovascular, bony, muscular, and visceral vital structures are located in small, deep spaces that can be injured with serious complications. So how to obtain a physiological surgery approach? We must consider and answer these questions. Is the lesion reducible? How is the direction of encroachment of the lesion? Is the etiology due to bony or soft tissue? Is this extra or intracranial? It is extra or intramedullary. What is the growth potential of this area? Does reducible lesions require primary stabilization? Does irreducible lesions require decompression? Also, we have to consider if there's a chance for radical resection 
use of chemo or radiotherapy if required. Regarding the occipital bone extends from the clivus anteriorly to the lumboid suture posteriorly. The superior nuchal line helps to localize the transverse sinus and the union shows a torcular heterophily. Insertion of the semispinalis capitis muscle is an accurate landmark for confluence of the sinuses. At the foramic magnum, we identify the following parts. The scamosal part, dorsally, the basal of clival and tubally, the condylar part, which articulates with the atlas, and the most posterior margin is the opiscent and the most arterial portion of the patient. Regarding the atlas, it has three ossification sites. In 5% of cases, is it complete the ring? It has inferior and uh, facets to articulate with the axis and superior facets to articulate with the occipital bone. Um, several ligaments are attached to the, to the atlas and we'll see um, further. The axis is the second cervical vertebrae that forms a pivot for the atlas and the head to rotate. It is formed from five ossification centers, two on the odontoid, one in the body, and one in each vertebral arch. The odontoid process projects cephalad from the body. On the ventral odontoid surface is a novel facet that articulates with the dorsal surface of the anterior arch of the atlas. On the dorsal surface, there is a transverse groove over which passes the transverse ligament of the atlas. The axis has a large concave piece of the spinous process, which is a landmark that can be palpated or recognized during surgery. Some landmarks that you can use when uh, placing transarticular screw. For example, the most important thing is to recognize the trajectory of the vertebral artery. In this case, there is a kind of 10 degrees uh, <clears throat> inclination in the axial plane, and the other is 40 degrees directed anterior to the tubercle of C1. We'll see later this on um, um, the next lecture. Regarding the ligaments, the anterior Atlanta occipital membrane biochemically helps to prevent hyperextension of the CPG and is thought to play a nominal role in the stability. It attaches to the anterior aspect of the atlas to the anterior rim of foramic magnum. The apical ligament does not contribute significantly to cranial cervical stability and is absent in about 20% of people. The tectorial membrane, on the other hand, firmly adheres to the dura posterior to the clivus to prevent ventral cord impeachment with neck flexion. Biomechanically is one of the major stabilizing ligaments of the CPG and only ligaments with dural attachment. The posterior atlantal cipital membrane is a thin ligament that attaches the posterior arch of the atlas to posterior rim of foramic magma superiorly. The posterior atlanta occipital membrane helps to prevent hyperflexion and impingement of the atlas on cervical medullary junction and plays a major role in stabilizing the posterior CPK. Ligament, okay, it's a cephalic extension of the supraspinous ligament from C7 spinous processes to the union of the occipital bone. Regarding the ligaments, you know this structures have a main role in the stabilization of the articulations. The apical ligament or suspensorial ligament attaches to the tip of the odontoid process to the basin and runs in the triangular area between the right and left alar ligaments at the supraodontoid space. The alar ligament holds the dense superiorly in close conjunction with the school base, an anterior C1 arch is attached from the lateral of the process to anterolateral part of the foramen magnum and medial aspect 
of the occipital condyles. These are major stabilizers maintaining integrity of the joint space. The transverse ligament is the largest, strongest craniocervical ligament and maintains stability, pushing the entire process anteriorly against the posterior aspect of the arch of C1 and forms part of the cruciform ligament. The cruciform ligament instead is thin and weak and provides no real stability to this joint. The accessory ligament inserts medially in the dorsal surface of the axis and goes laterally and superiorly to the lateral mass of the atlas. Regarding the mechanical properties of the atlantoccipital joint, flexion and extensions are their linear motions and translations primarily determined by bony structures. The main motions of this 23 to 24 degrees of motion. The mechanical properties of the atlanto axial joint is rather an axial rotation. This is an angular motion and produces my ligamentous structures. This rotation to be about 23 to 38 degrees. The barrel ligament is present in 92% of cases and inserts anterior to the other ligament functions to resist extension of the atlantic occipital joint, acting synergistically with the anterior atlantic occipital membrane. The tectorial membrane at the posterior border and supraplantoid space runs posterior to the cruciform ligament. It is composed of three layers and fused together to the posterior longitudinal ligament. Kinematics and biomechanics of the motions of the atlantic occipital and occipital atlantic cements, it's very important to know. Injuries to the atlanto axial complex may be described using the concept of major injury vector, representing in summary of the most important forces applied and torques to this region of the spine. The concept of instantaneous center of rotation is a parameter that reflects the kinematic behavior of the spine that helps to differentiate the normal versus injured and stable spine and can be measured during flexibility testing. What happens with these ligaments do not work properly? The LR ligament failure results in modest rotatory atlantic axial instability. They are important limited axial rotation and stabilized during flexion and extension. The transverse atlantal ligament failure, which is the thickest and the strongest, uh, results in subluxations up to 12 millimeters, making this articulation very unstable so a fusion must be performed. The capsular ligament failure, uh, slightly during axial rotation, has little effect on bending or flexion and extensions. Ligaments like this are called the first line of defense against hyper rotation. What are the effects of transoral oidospectomy? When it is removed, the rotational movements are increased in C1, C2, and the translational movements also increases especially the anterior posterior direction. So this altered significantly the motion and the stability of this junction. Some lines we have to review to explain some of the diseases that occur at this place. The Chamberlain line extends from the heart palate to the opistium, and the other tip is usually below or to Janesville. If more than 2.5 millimeters are above, uh, in basilar invagination should be suspected. And it is more than 6.6 .6 millimeters, it is confirmed. In McGregor lines extends from the heart plate tangent, the under surface of the occipital bone. The odontoid should not be less than 4.5 millimeters above. The McGregor line, goes from the patient to the opistium. 
and the odontoids should not project above this line. Some cases of cherry malformation, we can see the sense of the tonsils lower than five millimeters of this line. Also the Wackenham line, uh, the fish gold, the gastric lines, and the Atlantic occipital joint angle are used to evaluate this region. These lines should be well known depending on each case. Some examples how to use these uh, lines, when you can see the adaptive tip above this line, this angle is increased regarding the Wackenheim's line. Also, you can see that not coincide with the dense, but rather forms an angle. And many other pathologies that you can uh, apply this radiological features. One of the most important anatomical points to remember in the surgery of the craniovertebral junction is the position of the arterial artery. It, it can have very, very different anomalies. So you should consider before performing the surgery and be careful when I say them about this region. Some of the segmental types, different branches, fenestrations, bone holes that can be changed. So when you are dissecting this part, uh, care should be taken not to use the body when they say it immediately to laterally, more than one centimeter, because you can find different uh, forms of this uh, artery. Uh, a few words about the, the approaches um, to reach the CP junction, the surgeon should select the most appropriate approach according to the location and extent of the lesion, allowing the most extended and direct operative field with the lowest rate of morbidity. Since the oncological stage in by Enneke in 1980, this system has been applied to the spinal cord, dividing two more stages is one, two, three, B9, malignant tumors, four stages, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and metastatic high grade extra compartmental 3A, 3B, based on clinical, radiological, histological data. So here's an outflow graphic so you can make a decision depending how to go to this region. Uh, most uh, used are the transnasal, transoral, superior uh, cervical and the posterior approaches and the midline and uh, lateral fixation. A few words about the transoral approach. When you are opening the mouth and you are retracting the uvula um, and performing um, in, incision and the palate, um, it is important that you can consider the use of and assistance of the, the oral uh, surgeon and general surgeon. And some complications may uh, come from this uh, approach. Um, when you are divided, try to not cut the soft plate unless the clivus needs to be exposed. The apical lig um, alar ligaments are transected to allow removal of the dense. Closure of the mucosa can be done, it's okay. Uh, but sometimes fistulas can be seen and the rate of infection is not so low. So it's, it's preferably try not to use this uh, um, approach. Uh, regarding the endoscopic approach, you can see the endoscopic in the nasal approach. Uh, the portion above this nasal palatine line can be accessed using endoscopic in the nasal approach. So it represents the lowest limit where you can of, uh, go by this approach. Regarding the limitations, you can see that we cannot access the C2, three discs, or a copectomy cannot be made by this small corridor. And also ventral reconstruction of the access with a plate or cage is not possible. So dural repairs can also be challenging during this surgery. And you can see the lateral limits the extracting tooth uh, for the lateral uh, resection. 
Uh, finally, for re regarding the lateral transcordial approach, uh, one of the main objectives is to preserve the vertebral artery, whether uh, mobilized, transposition or not, management uh, around the occipital condyle, whether it's a partial or total removal, and the posterior cervical fusion that can help to stabilize uh, the region. Um, to approach the anterior cervical higher uh, spine, uh, usual landmarks are the iliac bone, the angle of the mandible, the mystoid tip, and the anterior border of the sternocleidal mystoid. When you are performing this surgery at the lower segments, the sternocleidal mystoid muscle is at the main references. And then you can go and palpate the carotid pulse, pervertebral fascia, and internally you can be in the longus colloid muscle. But when you are going to the upper region, we can use a different incision, as you can see here, um, submandibular skin incision type CBLU. So the angle of the mandible at the midline near higher bone is exposed. We can see the platysma and we perform a subplatysmal flap, developing and exposing the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia. Then we can identify the marginal uh, mandibular branch of the facial nerve, which is very important to preserve. And some of the most useful landmarks are the gastric muscle, the facial vein, which sometimes can be ligated, uh, submandibular gland, the great auricular nerve. And so when we are identifying these elements and making a retraction, and the upper part of the relaxation, you can find the epiglossal nerve and also the tyroid artery and superior laryngeal nerves. Once you have identified these structures, you can go and attack the cervical spine uh, safely. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Salazar. Uh, an excellent lecture, very didactic. And to keep the program going, I have uh, the pleasure of presenting uh, one of the best and most condecorated professors in, in history, in neurosurgery. And it's a pleasure for us, for the whole uh, Quadron Society to have uh, him with us today. Uh, professor Atul Goel, he's the professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery, King Edward Memorial Hospital and said Medical College in Mumbai, India. Uh, in so many uh, different staff positions, uh, he has been chief in, an editor-in-chief in, of International Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine, and advisory board member of uh, other renowned journals. Of course, he's an honorary member of the Japan, uh, the Venezuelan, Bangladesh, Egyptian, and so many other neurosurgical societies. He has been the past president of the Asia Oceanic School Based Surgery uh, Society. He is author of many, many, many books, book chapters, and publications. And of course, Professor Atul has one of the most and great experiences in cavernous service, in cavernous uh, sinus surgery, and of course, in the uh, CBJ uh, 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 region. So it's my pleasure, Professor Atul, to uh, kindly welcome you today. and. Let us have your experience. Thank you very much, Professor. Do you have my professor, slide? Professor, we're not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now we are. Now you have my slide? Yes, Professor. And we are hearing you too. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Baron, for that invitation, George, for that invitation. And uh, there is no question that it is my big honor and a great pleasure to participate in this very important webinar from your very popular society. I wish I can visit you one of these days sooner than later. So I'm going to present a little bit different version of spine, a different thought process. Whenever you talk about spine or spinal surgery, 
you talk about compression and you talk about decompression. So decompression forms the major concept or major issue in the treatment of any spinal disorder. So I am going to introduce you some concept and I wish I want, wish I take you beyond decompression, beyond the issue of decompression. So this is new spinal surgery. And in my estimation, a revolution in spine surgery. So the concept is, of course, we are not discussing tumors. Instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. Compression, compression is not the issue and decompression is not the treatment. So obviously this is a very uh, different statement I'm making from the rest of the world of spinal surgeons. So let me see how I can validate this concept and introduce to you a new philosophy in the management of spinal disorders, craniovertebral junction and cervical spine and lumbar spine, spinal degeneration and lumbar degeneration and things like that. So what makes a human body different is that we humans have a standing position. No other animal on the planet has standing human-like position. And because we are standing humans, standing position, throughout our life, our back muscles are active. In a bird like this, the shoulder muscles are active. In a four-legged animal, four legs, the shoulders and hip are the strong muscles and you can get weakness of these muscles, issue of spinal weakness or extensor muscle weakness is not prominent in these animals. So this extensor weakness is the main issue in human body, which is not there in any other animal on the planet. So I introduce you a concept of vertical facetal instability. And I have no hesitation to say that instability is the point of genesis of cervical or lumbar spondylotic disease. As you know, my study on spine has been based on craniovertebral junction. And I will introduce you some concepts on craniovertebral junction and how they have influenced me in generation of concepts regarding subaxial spine. First, I want to talk about basilar invagination, which George has also discussed. In the year 1998, the concept in general in the world was that odontoid process compresses the cord in this group, which I labeled as group one. And in this group, the tonsillar herniation compresses the cord. So the issue was transoral decompression for this group and foramen magnum decompression for this group. Even my article in 1998 says that do transoral decompression, do foramen magnum decompression for this, this group. So this was my own concept. Because the region was stable, the consideration of stabilization was not at all very clear at that time in 1998. In the year 2004, my concept little bit changed. Little bit changed for group A basilar invagination where I said for the first time in the literature that this group is unstable. And this group can be, the treatment for this group is not transoral decompression, but craniovertebral junction realignment is the treatment for this group of patients. For this group of patients, we said that foramen magnum decompression is a treatment because this is a fixed anomaly. So we said that this is not fixed, this is unstable. This was my concept in the year 2004. So for this kind of basilar invagination where I used to do transoral surgery myself for a long period of time, I said 
you open the atlantoaxial joint, distract the facets, realign the craniovertebral junction, and stabilize the atlantoaxial joint. There is no need for decompression. So we said no decompression from transoral root. So over the years, this was my first case in the year 2000. Now it is 21 years where I am performing this operation. No transoral decompression, open the joint, distract the facets, realign the craniovertebral junction, and no decompression, only stabilization. So we now have several hundreds of these patients where we have not done any kind of decompression, only stabilization and realignment. For rotatory dislocation, the whole world was doing only decompression. There was no other treatment other than halo traction and observation. Other than that, there was decompression. That was the only treatment. So we introduced the concept of opening the joint, realigning the facets, and realigning the and reducing the dislocation. So this was my very beautiful article in the year 2011, where we introduced this concept of realignment and no decompression. Even for these kind of traumatic patients where there are the facets are completely malaligned, open the joint, distract and realign the facets, introduced a new era in the craniovertebral junction treatment. And many of you know, and those who are interested in craniovertebral junction surgery know this concept of realigning the craniovertebral junction. George will know, and many older people in the audience will know, that there was an entity called fixed or fixed atlantoaxial instability. So in the year 2005, we introduced a concept that there is nothing like fixed atlantoaxial dislocation, open the joint, reduce the atlantoaxial instability, and realign the craniovertebral junction. So we introduced that there is nothing like fixed, they are abnormally mobile and pathologically mobile. And this is not a fixed dislocation. Open the joint, distract the facet, realign the craniovertebral junction. There is no need for transoral decompression or foramen magnum decompression. So this completely, this concept has revolutionized the treatment of such fixed atlantoaxial instability and realignment and stabilization. So now my concept has changed over the years. So now I say that there is no, not even the need for realignment. Instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. And I will discuss how these concepts have influenced my treatment for degenerative spine in the subsequent part of this lecture. So basilar invagination, instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. And transoral surgery, which I used to do on multiple occasions, I think and I have no doubt that it is a completely historical operation. <clears throat> I must tell you, I'm not talking about tumors and chordomas and things like that. I'm talking of these kind of unstable situations. So the facets are the issue. All the muscles of the back are focused on the facets. And when there is muscle weakness due to disuse, abuse, misuse, or injury, the facets become malaligned, or there is an instability at the region of facets. So in the year 1999, we introduced a very beautiful concept that basilar invagination is like lumbosacral listhesis, and it is C1 over C2 listhesis. Like you treat lumbosacral listhesis, you treat basilar invagination by realignment and stabilization in 1999. So in 1999, we identified such cases where there was basilar invagination we, and there was listhesis of C1 over C2. There is no need for any kind of decompression. Open the joint, realign the facets and craniovertebral junction realignment. So there is no decompression in the format of treatment. 
More recently, about 13 or 14 years ago, we introduced another very revolutionary concept in craniovertebral junction and introduced central or axial atlanto axial instability and identified that such instability is present in several cases like Chiari malformation, seringomyelia, cervical degeneration, spinal deformities, o OPLL and Hirayama disease, and many other diseases. So central or axial atlanto axial instability, this concept in my estimation has completely revolutionized spinal surgery and I will like to introduce this subject to you. Now carefully see this slide. This is C1 over C2 listes. Atlantodental interval is increased. There is neural compression. There is no need for any kind of bone removal in an unstable spine. You do open the joint, realign and stabilize and that is the treatment. Decompression is not the treatment. Now you see another instability. The facet of C1 goes behind or reverse or retrolysthesis of C1 over C2. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance. There is severe basilar invagination. The whole world will do foramen magnum decompression. I say foramen magnum decompression is a negative operation for this entity. Unstable situation, stabilization is the treatment. Now I want to introduce another beautiful thing for you. Even when the facets are in alignment, even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, presence of tonsillar herniation, presence of syringomyelia, presence of assimilation of atlas, presence of clipal file abnormality, presence of platybasia, and presence of a host of other so-called anomalies are related to chronic, now you mark my word, chronic or long-standing atlantoaxial instability. Stabilization is the treatment and magic is the outcome. The syringomyelia will disappear, the tonsil will reverse. More importantly, the patient will remarkably improve in symptoms. There is no need for any kind of decompression in such cases of carry and syrinx. So that is my concept, even in the absence of facetal malalignment, even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance. So over the years we have written, we have done several cases. You can see I had published some years ago, 510 cases of group A and 75 cases of group V. And we have identified that atlanto axial instability is the issue and atlanto axial stabilization is the treatment. There is no need for any kind of decompression. So I will show you some cases of tonsillar herniation and syringomyelia. The whole world will do foramen magnum decompression. I am saying that these are related to atlantoaxial instability, even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is a doubtful facetal instability. I call such instability where there is no atlantodental instability as central or axial instability. You stabilize the atlantoaxial joint and believe me, my dear friends, you see a magic, a magic that you have never seen with foramen magnum decompression. The patient will improve dramatically. The syrinx will reduce. In If you do one year scan after one year, 100% of patients, the syringomyelia will reduce. Even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is no facetal malalignment, presence of tonsillar herniation, presence of assimilation of atlas, presence of various other anomalies are indicators of unstable atlantoaxial joint and atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. In the year 1998, I had said myself in my article, which I showed you, that there is a tight posterior fossa. I now realize that there is no tight posterior fossa. The subarachnoid spaces are quite wide. The fourth ventricle is quite wide and subarachnoid spaces in front of the medulla are quite wide. Even the subarachnoid spaces around the spinal cord, which I now like to call 
as external syringomyelia are quite wide. So there is too much water in the spinal canal, in the cranial cavity. There is no need for decompression. What is the problem is atlantoaxial instability. So we have now several hundred cases where for Chiari and syringomyelia, we have done only stabilization. And I can say, my dear friends, without any doubt and without any confusion that atlantoaxial instability is the cause. The only issue is these operations are not easy. These operations are difficult. These operations can be dangerous. So if you think that they are dangerous, that does not mean they're not correct. Foramen magnum decompression is an absolutely negative operation in my estimation. You see how the syringomyelia has reduced. You see how the spaces behind the cerebellum has increased. This was preoperative, this was postoperative. Only fixation, no decompression. So this is preoperative and postoperative. Immediate postoperative in after 10 days of surgery, you see syringomyelia has reduced. After one year of surgery, 100% patient syringomyelia will reduce. So now I say that atlantoaxial instability is the main issue. Chronic atlantoaxial instability is the main issue. Basal invagination, syringomyelia, platybase, CR, uh, assimilation of atlas, C23 fusion, um, os odontoidium, bifid spine, cervical fusions are all secondary to secondary. They are all naturally protective and they are all reversible following atlantoaxial stabilization. So this was my article in Journal of Neurosurgery in 2013, where I said that atlantoaxial instability is the cause of Chiari malformation and atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. More recently, I published my experience with 388 cases where I have done only fixation and I wish you can read this article. I said Chiari is not a pathology Tonsillar herniation is not bad. It is a nature's protective airbag. It is not a malformation. It is a formation. So I have changed the nomenclature of carry malformation to carry formation. Cervical fusion, as you see in triple file abnormality, are due to atlantoaxial chronic instability. They are protective and they are potentially reversible. Bifid anterior and posterior arches are secondary to chronic atlantoaxial instability. They are naturally protective and they are reversible following atlantoaxial instability. So when you see multiple bone fusions, bifid, there is no way you can do decompression. There is no way you can do corpectomies and laminectomies and things like that. Even when there is no compression of the cervical spinal cord, no compression, Presence of bone fusion, presence of bifid are indicators of atlantoaxial instability and stabilization is the treatment. Os odontoidium is also a protective natural phenomena in the presence of chronic instability and stabilization is the treatment. Transoral decompression, which is still done and I saw in George's slide, for os odontoidium transoral decompression is an absolutely negative operation in this unstable atlantoaxial instability. This paper of mine, which I published in 1996, has completely changed the philosophy of understanding of syringomyelia. I have said that syringomyelia is not a pathology. It is a, neg it is a natural protective phenomenon. Idiopathic syringe like this, nobody in the world knows what to do and how to do and whether to do anything. Syringo plural shun and syringo subarachnoid shuns are the common form, form of treatment. I introduced the concept that there is central or axial instability in such cases. You do atlantoaxial stabilization and you give new life to this person. New life completely without hesitation, without any doubt, and the syringe will disappear. Long-standing musculoskeletal abnormalities like short neck, clip, torticollis, and various other anomalies, which I have already talked about, 
short neck, torticollis. These are not, these are naturally protective and they are secondary to atlantoaxial instability. Life for lumbar disc, scoliosis and kyphosis are common. You do atlantoaxial stabilization, the neck will become long and the neck will become straight. straight. This kind of torticollis, you do not need any corpectomy, any form of decompression. You do stabilization and you see the magic. So there are many, many patients of mine where I have done atlantoaxial stabilization and created magic. Another beautiful thing I want to show you, this kind of kyphoscoliosis, many people will do multiple screws and rods for this kind of kyphoscoliosis. We have identified that a whole lot, a huge lot of patients with such deformities, deformities have chronic atlantoaxial instability associated with tonsillar herniation, with syringomyelia, even without tonsillar herniation and without syringomyelia, you identify craniovertebral junction, central atlantoaxial instability, you stabilize and you see the magic, a magic that you have never realized in spine surgery. There is no need for doing multi-level drawer and screw fixation, which I used to do myself some years ago. So there is a potential for giving these beautiful smiles to these young patients if we understand what is craniovertebral junction, what is atlantoaxial instability. Another beautiful thing I want to talk about is the issue of central or axial atlantoaxial instability as a diagnosis, as a cause of cervical myelopathy. You see, there is no compression at the craniovertebral junction, no compression at all but there is bifid. So bifid, when it is present, it is secondary to atlantoaxial instability. You have to stabilize it. If there is C23 fusion, if there is syringomyelia, if there is carry, if there is basilar invagination, all are indicators of atlantoaxial instability. All are indicators of atlantoaxial stabilization. Now you see this another patient, beautiful. There is a cervical kyphosis. Don't do decompression here there is a central or axial atlantoaxial instability. You have to stabilize. I have, I have stabilized multiple segments and you see the outcome. The hand was not going up in the immediate post-operative. So understanding this fact, understanding central axial instability can completely change your concepts. You see the shoulder drooping in the immediate post-operative period, the shoulder has come back to normal. So now I'm saying that foramen magnum decompression can come become completely historical operation. So on the basis of understanding of these issues in craniovertebral junction, I have now migrated my understanding to cervical spine, to lumbar spine, and which I want to talk about in my lecture to, to your society. And I hope you don't think don't talk about controversial issue. You think what is positive for you and take those messages. Anterior approaches for cervical spine have been very common. And this was my own chapter in Schwitt and Smidek, where I have written a chapter on anterior approaches to cervical spondylosis. I have written. So I was doing. And these kind of cases we were doing on multiple occasions for a long period of time. I now introduce to you, my dear friends, different concept. We have been, another thing which I had published, this is this tricortical screws. Several years ago, about 25 years ago, I had discussed about the strength of these kind of screws. Now I'm talking of another concept. And please carefully look. If you read the literature, the whole world talks about disc degeneration, disc space reduction, reduction of water content of the disc, as the nodal point of pathogenesis of, sp of spinal degeneration. So we blame the disc. Now I am saying, do not blame the disc, blame the muscles, blame the weakness of the muscles. Due to various reasons, your muscles become weak and there can be facetal weakness at the point of facets and instability. So my concept now is absolutely clear that instability at the facets, not this degeneration is the primary issue in spinal degeneration. 
craniovertebral junction instability due to degeneration has never been discussed in the literature. My concept is more the movement, more the potential of instability and spinal degeneration. I want you to carefully look at these slides. Please carefully look at these slides. Reduction in the joint space, buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament, osteophyte formation are not primary events. They are secondary to vertical spinal instability, vertical due to weakness of these muscles. Atlantoaxial instability is the issue in all these cases. Atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. Decompression is not the treatment. Ossification in the apical ligament. Do not do transoral decompression. This is an unstable atlantoaxial joint. Stabilization is the treatment and no decompression. Retroodontoid pseudotumor. The whole world was doing transoral decompression for such cases. We introduced the concept that retroodontoid pseudotumor is secondary to vertical spinal atlantoaxial instability. It is an evidence of atlantoaxial instability. It is it indicates the need for atlantoaxial stabilization. This is like an osteophyte, second, like a subaxial spinal osteophyte. This is related to unstable atlantoaxial joint. In my calculation, this concept has completely revolutionized in the whole world the treatment of retroodontoid pseudotumor. And there are several articles on that subject in the literature. This retroodontoid cyst formation is not a primary event. It indicates atlantoaxial instability. There is no need for decompression in such cases. You stabilize and there is a potential for immediate postoperative disappearance of this retroodontoid pseudotumor. This kind of cyst, you see there is clear evidence of unstable spine, clear evidence of atlantoaxial instability. You stabilize and this cyst will spontaneously disappear. There is no need to do any kind of decompression. Os odontoidium, you see there is a cyst behind the C2 body and there is a buffer zone inside the body. You do flexion, this goes inside. You do extension, it goes outside. There is a dynamic situation a protective natural phenomena. You do atlantoaxial stabilization. There is no need for any kind of decompression in such situation and in this kind of situation where you are seeing retroodontoid pseudotumor with a buffer inside the bone. You, there is no facetal instability. This is central or axial due to vertical spinal instability. You stabilize and this compression disappears. So please read my this article on this subject and you will get beautiful, beautiful points out of this. Retroodontoid panis, which we have heard and we have talked about for in rheumatoid arthritis is a feature due to vertical spinal instability. This is due to buckling of posterior longitudinal ligament. You do stabilization and the retroodontoid panis can disappear in the immediate postoperative period. We introduced these kind of intra-articular spaces. Those who are interested in craniovertebral junction must be knowing about these intra-articular spaces because these are very popular in the whole world. And we introduced this about 20 years ago, these kind of spaces. The issue is we talk of C1, C2 instability and C1, C2 facetal instability. We never talk of subaxial spinal facetal instability. Facets are the strongest part of the spinal vertebra, much stronger than the vertebral body, much stronger than the spinous process, much stronger than the transverse process. Stabilization is the strongest here. Instability is always at the facets. Stabilization should always be at the facets. So you see this C1, C2 instability we have talked about. Nobody in the world has ever talked about subaxial facetal instability, facetal due to muscle weakness. 
Now carefully see this slide. Reduction in the intervertebral body space. Buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Bulging of the disc at multiple segments are not primary events. They are secondary to vertical spinal instability. They are not only protective, they are reversible following stabilization. These osteophyte formation are not primary event. Reduction in the body space is not a primary event. They are secondary to vertical spinal instability. These kind of bulges in the multi-segments are not primary event. They are secondary. They are protective. And they are, there is a potential of reversal following stabilization. So you please remember this concept. So vertical spinal instability is the point of genesis of spinal spondylotic disease. See this slide very carefully. Now there is a disc bulge. So the whole world will come and do removal of the disc and removal of the osteophyte. We introduce intra-articular spacers and you see the ligamentum flavum has debuckled. The posterior longitudinal ligament has debuckled and there is a new disc formation. So this was my old concept. This is not my new concept. I will come to my new concept a little while later. So we introduced that facet distraction spacers as a treatment of degenerative spinal disease and we introduced a new hypothesis for spinal degeneration about 10 or 12 years ago. Carefully see this slide. Buckling of the ligamentum flavum, buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament, bulging of the disc. You do distraction. You do distraction of the facets. The whole spinal canal becomes normalized and returns to normal situation. So multi-level facetal intra-articular spaces have completely changed my own concept in the treatment of spinal degeneration, where I say that there is no need for any kind of decompression, no need for decompression. You do distraction and you do complete stabilization and normalization. You can do multi-segmental facetal distraction. So essentially what I am saying is, that there is no need for any kind of decompression in spinal degeneration. What we need is arthrodesis or stabilization of these spinal segments. So you see another case where the compression has completely gone. So now I'm saying compression is not the issue. Instability is the issue. Compression is not primary. Decompression is not the treatment. Compression is protective. Compression should not be touched. Instability is the issue and stabilization and arthrodesis of the spinal segments is the treatment. So this arthrodesis is the treatment, no decompression. And I have got several hundred cases with this kind of treatment. And you have to please see the literature and my publications on the subject where I have done no decompression, only arthrodesis. So this was a new concept. Now this is not my new concept, this is my old concept. And what is my new concept, I will talk about very soon. So this was published in the year 2011 as a cover page illustration in Journal of Neurosurgery. And I wish and I hope you will get an opportunity to read this article, Intra-Articular Facetal Distraction without any decompression. And this is a new concept, a new philosophy. This is highly patented by me in various forums in US in India and things like that. Same concept I have discussed about lumbar canal stenosis, where I do not do any kind of decompression. I call it secondary to vertical spinal instability vertical facetal instability. You stabilize using facetal distractor spaces and you see the magic with your own eyes. There is no need for decompression. So this article was also published in Journal of Neurosurgery in the year 2013 with multi-level spaces. So essentially decompression of the compressed or deformed <coughs> 
neural system has been the basis of surgical treatment for spine surgeons for, spine, <clears throat> for several decades. I introduce to you, my dear friends, a new concept. You please carefully see this concept. I am saying that there is only fixation for cervical spondylosis. I published this hypothesis in 2013. And now in 2020, I introduced my experience with a large number of cases, 215 cases, where I say, this was published in World Neurosurgery, where I say that muscle weakness related spinal instability is the cause of cervical spinal degeneration and spinal stabilization is the treatment, no decompression. So there is this kind of bulge here. The whole world will come from front and remove this ACDF. And as I mentioned to you, I was myself doing. So here what I have done is transarticular fixation from behind, use this spinous process as bone graft and do stabilization. After eight months of surgery, you see the osteophyte has completely disappeared and this patient will improve remarkably, magically in the immediate post-operative period. So these kind of multi-segmental compressions, multi-segmental osteophytes, you see how the whole thing has disappeared after two years of surgery. There is no decompression, only stabilization. I cannot show you the video here because it is in Indian language, but this fellow has completely and remarkably improved. So this is another case of multi-level compression from front, compression from behind. You will either go from front and do multi-level discoidectomy and osteophyte resection or corpectomy, or the gold standard treatment is multi-level laminectomy or laminoplasty. I am saying this is an unstable situation. You stabilize the spine using transarticular fixation, which is a very simple surgical procedure. I do five level fixation in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And you see the outcome after some years of surgery, the whole thing has normalized. The osteophytes have disappeared. The ligamentum flame buckling has gone and there is a new disc formation. Basically instability is primary, osteophyte formation and other things are secondary. So we introduced a new concept in degenerative cervical myelopathy. And there are several articles as I have listed here. Instability is the cause of symptoms, not compression, not ligamentum flammum buckling, not disc herniation, and stabilization is the treatment. Not neural deformation or compression, but instability is the cause of symptoms. Very different kind of concept very different kind of understanding, but you must remember whatever I'm saying are all published in topmost journals of neurosurgery. What is very important when you are treating degenerative spine is to identify which levels are unstable. What are the indicators of spinal instability? It is not just radiology. It is not just radiological compression, clinical correlation, has to be absolutely because compression, we are used to seeing compression. We talk about compression. We don't talk about instability because instability may not be radiologically evident. Now you see this two level compression and I have done four level fixation. There is no compression here. Why I have done four level fixation? You see, I have done four level fixation on the basis of clinical and radiological observation and understanding of the facetal anatomy. And you see these osteophytes have completely disappeared after about 16 months of surgery and there is no compression at all. More important is the patient will remarkably, remarkably improve in the immediate post-operative period, like you have not seen following corpectomies, like you have never seen following laminoplasty and decompression. So I am saying decompression is a negative form of treatment. Discoidectomy is a negative form of treatment. You may find some improvement because you have stabilized, but you see for these kind of multiple, the whole world will do multi-segmental decompressions from front or from behind. So you see, there is no decompression, only stabilization and arthrodesis is the treatment. 
for such a beautiful issue. Another issue which is completely and highly neglected in spine surgery is atlantoaxial instability in cases with multi-level cervical spondylotic myelopathy. We never talk of instability at the atlantoaxial joint. I am saying, my dear friends, atlantoaxial instability is very commonly associated with multi-level spinal degeneration and missing atlantoaxial instability. You see, there is no compression at the atlantoaxial joint, but there is facetal instability. You have to include atlantoaxial joint in the stabilization construct. There is no need for any kind of decompression. It is due to vertical spinal instability. You stabilize using transarticular camillus technique of fixation, and you see the beautiful magic that you have never realized in spinal degeneration. Cases of spinal spondylosis with severe myelopathy. I am saying when you identify when a patient comes on a wheelchair, when the patient is unable to walk, severe myelopathy is almost always associated with atlantoaxial instability, almost always associated with atlantoaxial joint instability. You have to include atlantoaxial joint in your stabilization construct. And you see the magic of radiology <clears throat> and magic of clinical changes. So I will show you some cases where I've done only stabilization in severe myelopathy. I have included atlantoaxial stabilization in this fixation construct. <clears throat> Multi-level degeneration from front, from behind. This is not a primary process. This is not pathological. It is buckling due to vertical instability. You stabilize and they disappear. You stabilize and they respond. You order and they behave. There is no need to kill these people. There is no need to absolutely demolish this beautiful ligamentum flavum given to us by God. No need to demolish osteophytes which are given by God. No need of removing this posterior longitudinal ligament, which is beautiful structure, which has been given to us as a gift following our spinal degeneration. Same concept I introduced for lumbar canal stenosis, and this was published in Neurosurgical Focus, where I say that these kind of multi-level bulges are not primary processes. They are due to vertical spinal instability, you have to stabilize using transarticular fixation and you see the magic with the patient. And I have got several patients with these kind of lumbar canal stenosis where I have introduced two screws in a transarticular fashion or even three screws in a transarticular fashion without any form of decompression. So these are highly published. You can argue, you can contradict, you can say no, I, I don't agree, I don't believe, but these are all published concepts and you have to respect the publications. Whether it is necessary to remove osteophytes in degenerative spondylotic myelopathy. You see these osteophytes, the entire spine surgery is focused on removal of osteophytes. I have already said that osteophyte removal is not necessary. And this was my article. You see these multi-level osteophytes? These are all spontaneously disappeared following only stabilization. Multi-level osteophytes completely disappeared following only stabilization without any form of decompression. Multi-level osteophytes completely disappeared following transarticular multi-level stabilization. So the question is, is spinal canal stenosis a correct term? I am saying that spinal canal stenosis is an absolutely wrong term because when there is stenosis, you have to do decompression. So I am saying that this you should call multi-segmental spinal instability due to muscle weakness. Deformities of cervical spine. I am saying deformities are not primary issues. Don't do corpectomies in this situation. Don't do decompression in such situation. <clears throat> when there is atlantoaxial instability, do atlantoaxial inst stabilization. When there is this kind of kyphotic curve, 
they need multi-segmental stabilization and there is no need for any kind of decompression from front or from behind. When there is, when there is central or axial atlantoaxial instability, you have to stabilize atlantoaxial joint along with subaxial stabilization. And I have to tell you, my dear friends, a magic will be seen in the immediate post-operative period that you have not ever realized for don't do any kind of decompression in such a situation. Another very potentially controversial, potentially controversial, and I'm sure many of you from Ecuador may not, may argue with me, may, con, may, may not completely or entirely agree with me. Prolapsed herniated disc is the big menu for spinal surgeons. You see prolapsed disc, you want to remove it. You want to remove it. I am saying that prolapsed and herniated disc you can treat by only stabilization without touching the herniation. So only spinal treat fixation as the treatment of prolapse disc is an absolute future for such an issue, which is a very commonly done operation. So this single level herniation, I am sure nobody from you in the world, not only from Ecuador, in the world will agree that trans cervical and ACDF is the established. Everybody does that treatment. And I have mentioned to you that I also did that treatment. Now I'm saying you do only stabilization and the disc will disappear, complete normalization of the spine and the patient will improve dramatically. Mark my word, dramatically in the immediate post-operative period. And this is published in World Neurosurgery fascial fixation arthrodesis as treatment of cervical radiculopathy. So I'm not saying just like that. It is based on heavy publication in top journals of the world. So lumbar radiculopathy, you can, you see the whole world of spine surgeons consider compression as the issue and decompression as the treatment. I'm saying that disc herniation is a result of instability or disc herniation causes instability. So it is either due to instability or instability is due to this. You stabilize like you do lumbar belt. You put cervical collar, the symptoms resolve. You can do internal stabilization and there is no need for any kind of decompression or resection of the disc. And you have to just believe in what I'm saying. And if you do not believe, I have no, you know, then you have to read the literature. If you do not believe the literature, then I have no answer to that question. So this kind of disc herniation, you can do multi-segmental or select segment, which segment is unstable that you have to identify on, not on only radiology, but also clinically, not just clinically, but intraoperatively, you can identify the unstable segment. Now I take you to the absolutely new concept on the treatment of OPLL absolutely new concept. You see ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament and cervical spondylosis, same is the cause and same is the treatment. Instability is the cause and stabilization is the treatment. I must also tell you that OPLL, my own several publications on OPLL, I have described about decompression. My article was the first in the literature where I introduced the concept of oblique corpectomy. Now I am saying that no need for corpectomy. This is my original concept. I published it. And now I am saying that these kind of oblique corpectomies, which I described for the first time in the literature about 20 years ago, are not necessary. I am saying that multi level OPLL is due to multi-segmental instability and only stabilization is the treatment. And this is my article, which I first published several years ago with my experience with 14 patients. And now my experience is recently, I published more recently. Of course, now my experience has further increased with 52 cases. I said that there is no need for decompression from front, no need from decompression from behind. Only stabilization is the treatment and inclusion of atlantoaxial joint in the stabilization construct is more often than not necessary in 
OPLL situation. Many of you know how to do corpectomies. Many of you have seen complications, but you have not seen magic. You have not seen the magic. You don't ignore this magic as a treatment for OPLL. So multi-segmental stabilization, inclusion of atlantoaxial joint is the treatment for multi-segmental OPLL. And you have to just see several patients of mine where I have done such a form of treatment where there is no decompression from front or from behind. So atlantoaxial and subaxial cervical spinal fixation, can it revolutionize surgical treatment of cervical myelopathy related to OPLL? My answer to that question is absolute, absolute yes, it will revolutionize. So this technique, which I have now followed for subaxial stabilization, I have modified a little bit. Sometimes I use two screws in a transarticular fashion, which I like to call double insurance transarticular screws, these kind of screws. I not, always do not do this. I always do one screw, but sometimes I introduce two screws. And sometimes for lumbar, I introduce three screws in transarticular in the facet, which is the strongest part of the spinal vertebra, strongest fixation point, much stronger than the bodies, much stronger than the pedicle. You have, and we all have neglected the facets for our stabilization. Please do not neglect the facet. You are creating a mistake and you are creating probably a difficult situation for a simple solution and a simple answer. So the thing is, can decompressive laminectomy for degenerative lumbar and cervical canal stenosis become historical? My answer is absolute yes. Is instability the nodal point of pathogenesis for both cervical spondylosis and OPLL? My answer is yes. My answer is decompression is not necessary. I remove transoral decompression from the face of his spine surgery. I have potential to remove foramen magnum decompression from the face of spine surgery. And now I'm saying that decompressive operations, both from front and from behind, can become absolutely historical. So like transoral decompression, will anterior spinal surgery find space in history book? Probably yes. So these kind of anterior surgery posterior surgery, corpectomies, laminectomies, laminoplasties have the potential of going into books of history. And that is a big possibility. Use Camille's technique and see the magic. From only decompression to only fixation has been a century long journey in the treatment of spinal spondylosis atlantoaxial and subaxial fixation, it will has the potential to completely revolutionize the treatment of spinal degeneration and OPL. So my dear friends, my concept is that compression is never primary. Compression is secondary and protective. Compression is natural. Compression is there to help you. Decompression is never, never the treatment. So this is my slide from one of my patients. And I say that there is a potential of completely revolutionizing spine surgery. So it is whether you accept it or you don't accept it, that is upon you. But at least I can ask you a favor. Please think about it. I know there will be several questions, several controversies, immediate repercussions of my lecture. But don't ask me questions now. Think about it, go home, read the articles which are in abundance in literature on this concept, and then probably you find a different answer to a common problem, different solution to our daily problem. Thank you very much, my dear friends. Thank you very much, Professor Atul Goel. It has been a great lecture as always. We are wondered about this kind of new philosophy regarding the treatment of spinal diseases. Uh, there are several issues that we have to keep in mind. The concept of the central atlantoaxial instability is a, a challenging concept because um, you talk about this uh, vertical concept of instability, 
Um, is there a kind of measurement that you can do to, to, to say this patient has a, a vertical instability? What kind of parameters do you use to, to measure this kind of instability? Can you? Yeah, <clears throat> see this kind of instability is, uh, <clears throat> may not be radiologically evident because you know, there is a facets. Facets are located laterally. Facets are located away from the neural structures. So facetal instability is not easily recognizable on radiological imaging. But there are secondary events. So like atlantoaxial instability, chronic instability when it happens, chronic instability when it happens, there are several secondary natural events. Like I talked about craniovertebral junction shortening of neck, torticollis, clipple file abnormalities. There are several, several, several events which happen in the, post, in the event of chronic instability. Similarly, chronic spinal instability, there are several, several things that happen. One is osteophyte formation. Second is disc bulging, disc space reduction, ligamentum flavum bulging, listhesis of the facies. <clears throat> These are radiological secondary events, clinical events. I will say, if you have a classical symptomatic presentation with radicular pain, with neck pain and all those things, even if there is no radiological evidence of osteophyte formation or compression, even when the MRI is normal, there is a possibility of stabilization and recovery from symptoms. So this kind of instability is a vertical instability. The concept is don't always look for compression. Don't always look for compression and don't always look for decompression as a treatment. There are other issues which we have to focus and this era is going to come, if not today, tomorrow. And you please keep a watch on this phenomena because the results are so beautiful. The outcome is so dramatic. Outcome of you, you get several patients on cervical degeneration. Why don't you do fixation for one of these? Why don't you do camillus techniques in the manner I have described? See for yourself. You might not, you might not, not succeed, but you have already stabilized, then you can come for decompression from front. At that time, you don't need to do decompression. I will tell you, I have never needed this kind of decompression since the time I have started this kind of stabilization. You please see this. You please try to understand a revolution in spine surgery. This is different. Nobody has talked about it. And I, have, I am talking before you on the basis of several, several publications, which I have shown you on, on your screen. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Ormar Halmouth, it's right in the hand. Please go ahead. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Thank, okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I am fine, Professor Atol. Professor Atol, uh, very nice presentation and uh, very uh, revolution in the uh, vertebral column operation or procedures, the revolution. We look for about the primary disease. Very nice. This idea, for uh, many years in my mind, uh, at Arabic, maybe you have uh, some ideas about in Arabic. We have some uh, person we make uh, to uh, traction of the neck. By we told them this is not a good at medical. By these things, uh, to make traction for the. Atlanto uh, the joint, okay. This make a distraction. It's very nice, okay. And we have now we I use the hanging, the hanging because this is the operation. Uh, I haven't uh, any idea about the make. So, uh, it's the screws, you know, how the screws for this uh, operation. How we, we use it Syria, and we are at no of Syria. 
how to make this uh, uh, familiar to all the world, this kind of operation you do. I just asking. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much, my dear friend. You are the leader of your region. I know it. And uh, these crews, you know, when I'm talking about these transarticular screws, these are quite uh, very, you know, these are not very expensive. These are not commercial. What, whenever I talk about, you know, I, you will ask me one question, how you thought about it. I thought about it because I never go for any commercial, you know, difficult implants, expensive implants. You can use simple implants, which are not very expensive and you can do better stabilization. So this, uh, this stabilization technique, which I have not described, this is Camille's technique, which he described in uh, 1972. And I have done several, several cases like this, very straightforward, very simple. I told you, I sometimes do five level fixation in 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Just take drill and do fixation at multiple level, my associates and my, senior associates exposed for me and I do fixation in 10 minutes, five level fixation. You do corpectomy and fixation, there is so much potential for danger, so much potential for injury, so much potential for deficits. You do transarticular fixation, there is no danger at all. And this is a beautiful, beautiful stabilization. You see it, I am saying, you know what, there are several senior spine surgeons, I can see them on my screen. <clears throat> And when you become senior, you are used to a particular technique, like ACDF, you are used to ACDF. The question is, you are so much happy with what you are doing, you don't want to change, but try. You know, the world, one small little change will change the whole world. I am saying there is a potential and there is a huge potential of completely changing spine surgery. The question is whether we are ready to accept it or whether we are not ready to accept it. That is the issue. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have here Professor Victor Hugo Perez. He's a master surgeon and a true anatomist. Uh, I would like to give him the word and to share some thoughts about this amazing revolutionary concept that Professor Atulwell has uh, taught us today. Victor, Victor is my great friend for a long time. And Victor's work, I know for a long time, and he has invited me to Mexico several times during, unfortunately, he invited me during COVID times. Mm -hmm. I want Victor to invite me during non-COVID times. I want to visit Mexico and I want to enjoy his hospitality. I know Victor is a, a person who can smile like this and laugh like this, will certainly be a fantastic host. Victor, please let me have your question. Hello, dear Professor Atul Gol. Uh, uh, yes, of course, I have invited you to Mexico, but uh, this year we are going to celebrate another Congress in Nove on November. Uh, I hope you could join us, not only you, all of you, uh, you are uh, welcome to Mexico. So I followed your uh, great uh, lecture with my with my models. And uh, I was doing some exercise here with this uh, uh, scale one per one uh, spine models. And I have a question, Dr. Uh, Atul Gol. Uh, I think uh, in some cases you show us a very strong compression uh, to the uh, cervical spinal cord. Uh, I have a dog. For example, if you make arthrodesis in the facets, then, uh, for example, uh, here we have a, a strong compression of the spinal cord. If, if you make uh, arthrodesis uh, in, the, in the facets, uh, it's possible to compress the spinal cord a little bit and can we, could we have a major ischemic lesion over the spinal cord or not? Have you ever had an accident, uh, for example, quadriparesis, uh, quadriplegia, uh, after doing this, especially in those case, cases with a very strong compression? 
So now I am saying, Victor, just listen to what I am saying. Just listen. <clears throat> See, I am saying that compression, you should not worry. I am saying that compression is not bad. I am saying compression is good and protective. I am saying compression is due to instability. I am saying you stabilize, the compression will automatically disappear. So when I do posterior fixation using Camille's technique, I am not manipulating the spine at all. I am not manipulating or touching. I am just exposing under traction. I do this operation and do Camille's fixation transarticular. Firm stabilization and beautiful stabilization. The other thing is when there is extensive compression, if you see are seeing on the imaging, the, there is a significant listhesis of the facets, significant listhesis. You can see with your eyes when you go there, the listhesis is much more when there is severe compression. So you reverse the listhesis and distract and fuse beautiful fixation. There is no danger, no danger to, the, to have injury due to the compression. So this has been my experience over several years now and over several cases now. So when OPLL, you are seeing OPLL, there is severe compression of the cord, severe in OPLL. So in severe compression, nobody talks of instability. They talk only see the, they see the compression. In that severe OPLL, you do stabilization and you see Absolutely, you know, OPLL, you can have several complications by the compression. You have seen, everybody has seen, you do corpectomy, multi-level corpectomy, you find severe deficits. You can have quadriplegia following surgery. You can have corpectomy is not a simple operation. We all know you do four level corpectomy. It is a time consuming operation. You do for three hours, four hours corpectomy. You don't do that. You don't do that. You stop doing it. And you see, you do this fixation and wait and watch. Don't have to do even laminectomy. When you do fixation, don't do laminectomy in OPLL, in degenerative spine. Just stabilize and see the magic. Only issue is, only issue is which level to be stabilized. It is not just the level where there is compression you stabilize. You may need stabilization above that level. You may need stabilization two segments above the level you may need stabilization at a level where there is no compression. So compression is not the only indicator of an unstable spine. Even situations where there is no compression, you might need stabilization. So this is a different concept. You just um, have to you know, go more into this to get more information and more experience with this kind of concept. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I understand, Professor Atul. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Professor Atul, um, I have seen that you use sometimes spacers and sometimes you use uh, screws. Uh, of course, everybody has its own technique and, and materials which are available. But uh, of course, some residents are asking, if you perform arthrodes, it's always you use a bone uh, material to do a, a permanent arthrodes. Uh, and some of the slides that you presented, I have not seen plates. Uh, you use the screws, but I, I don't see plates. How can you tell me about, about this? Uh, okay, detail? now I, I will say, you know, I describe these spaces, I introduce spaces intrafacetal spaces, we were the first one to describe in the literature about 15 years ago. But over the years, I have identified that you just do step fixation even without spaces, is it, it is good. There's no need to even distract. Instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. I describe spaces, but I do not introduce spaces in all my cases. I describe spaces, I have patent on it, and I have, you know, many companies want to make it. I have, I am not promoting any company. I am not a commercial person. I am a, you know, I work in a public institute, which is completely free of cost. So I am not having any commercial interest. 
Now I am talking about transarticular fixation. There is no need for any plate in transarticular fixation. Camillase technique, there is no need for any plate fixation in Camillase technique. For C1, C2 is a different issue. C1, C2, of course, you need a plate and you need, I don't use Camillase technique. I use my own technique, as you know, my technique for C1, C2, where I put one screw in facet of C1, one screw in facet of C2, and I combine with the plate. I am using it since 1988 when I introduced this concept. Now I have experience with more than 3000 cases of craniovertebral junction stabilization. So that is a different thing, but subaxial fixation, there's no need for plate in transarticular camulus technique of fixation. George. Thank you, thank you, Professor Atul. Uh, again, uh, Omar Ramal is raising the hand and then we go to with uh, Professor Igor Fakin. Another one, one more thing before uh, question is asked. I see in the, in the chat box, there is one question. They are asking me about my results and about my experience and all those things. I must tell you that all these results are heavily published in the literature. And I, if you have want to ask me, I will say that these are magical results. But what magic you can go and see in the publications, which are in World Neurosurgery and in various spine journals, in Journal of Neurosurgery, you please see. And you know, it is difficult for me to introduce you know, to give you exactly the tables of my outcome and result, but they are all published. You please see in the literature. Okay, question please for me. Professor Omar. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Professor George, uh, Professor Atom. Uh, I asked for subacute symptoms of cervical disc prolapse. This drastic walk, we can wait and we do the procedure uh, like the Toradon fixation, but fixation, this is my, uh, and can wait or uh, we do the, the uh, last uh, disc prolapse. If there's plastic walk. Sorry. You have to, you know, I couldn't hear the question properly, but we can go to the next question because there is some internet issue here. You want to go to the next question? George? Sure, Omar can text the question. Yeah. Go ahead, Igor. Professor Igor, please. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thanks, Professor Goyle. It's always a pleasure to hear you, Professor. And I think that uh, you changed some dogmas. And when we change some dogmas, it takes a little bit of time for, for the world to understand and try to, to change the practice. But uh, your data are published. It's evidence-based medicine, so there is no, no way to, to go against it. It's, it's spectacular. So uh, I hope to visit you in, at Mumbai someday. It would be a great, great, great pleasure to go and see you in, in local, how you do it. Uh, my question is very straightforward. I would like to know how many, how many times you wait uh, until the, the reversal of the, the Chiari and the reversal of syringomyelia. How many times after the procedure you ask for a, a image control and how many times in your series the, the changes from the disease uh, disappear if you have this, this, this answer or if, the, if it is um, case-based and it depends on each patient individually. Igor, you know that uh, Chiari malformation is treated in the whole world by foramen magnum decompression. Whole world treats by foramen magnum decompression. And I have no hesitation to say, and I have no doubt to say, and I have no controversy to say that foramen magnum decompression is not the correct treatment, is a negative treatment. The atlantoaxial joint is unstable in these situations, and to remove bone from behind, you are increasing the instability. There may be some improvement. You see, I am telling you, I was doing foramen magnum decompression. I showed you that article of mine where I do 
foramen magnum decompression myself. But now I am saying over several years that foramen magnum decompression is an absolutely negative treatment. That is one. Second thing is, in cases of Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, to do atlantoaxial stabilization is not an easy operation. It is a difficult operation because many of these cases have the basilar invagination associated, the atlantoaxial joint is rostrally situated, the venous congestion in that area in the presence of syringomyelia is more pronounced in these cases. So to do atlantoaxial joint fixation is not easy. But if you can do it, you can see the magic. So I have used word magic several times, my dear friend Igor. So you just take it in the right perspective. Second thing is you ask me a question, how much time it will take for syringomyelia to resolve? I have seen resolution of syringomyelia after five or seven days after surgery, some resolution in some cases. I am saying that there will be resolution or re reversal of um, reduction in syringomyelia in 100% cases after one year of surgery, in 100% of cases. And the syringomyelia will resolve. The question is, you know, you have to do a very solid fixation of C1, C2. Solid fixation involves opening of the C1, C2 articulation, the joint, introduction of bone graft into the C1, C2 articulation, and then do fixation. If you can do these three points, like opening of the joint, removal of the cartilage, introduction of bone graft into the articulation, and then do C1, C2 fixation. If you do you know, suboptimal kind of fixation, you may not get the results, but you have to do solid fixation. And you have to learn solid fixation of C1, C2 because it is not only essential for craniovertebral anomalies, for basilar invagination, for carry malformation, but also for spinal degeneration, also for OPLL, also for Hirayama disease, also for various other abnormalities. So you have to learn this C1, C2 fixation. And those who do not learn C1, C2 fixation will miss out on these huge number of abnormalities where this treatment is necessary. So I always say that atlantoaxial instability is the most common form of spinal instability. Atlantoaxial joint is most mobile. Atlantoaxial joint is most unstable. We do not recognize atlantoaxial instability. Atlantoaxial instability is the most under-recognized an undertreated clinical entity in my estimation. Igor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Igor. Nice to see you. Uh, Professor, Tull, I have a question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions regarding, for example, the difficulty in, in stabilizing the, the cervical region, especially in C1, C2, and so may use neural navigation as a guidance system. In your experience, uh, what did you say? What could you say about this? It's useful, actually. It wouldn't be so useful. And a second question: I have seen some reports, you know, that some people are doing some of these um, stabilization procedures with a patient in the semi-sitting procedure. Uh, what do you can say about this, Professor? One thing I can say: semi-sitting position is a very dangerous position for stabilization operation. That is one thing. Second thing is whether you want to use navigation, whether you want to use special kind of technological tool, of course you have to, if you have, you use them. But most important is, most important is to learn the anatomy of the region. As Victor always says, you learn the anatomy, learn the anatomy of vertebral artery. You see the anatomy of vertebral artery on radiological imaging. You can see the location of vertebral artery how high is the vertebral artery, how medial is the vertebral artery, and under vision, you have to do the operation. You can take navigation as an interesting and important technological uh, help, but more important is for C1, C2, for craniovertebral junction, you have to have the anatomy mastered in your mind because you can create disaster. 
when I say you can give new life, when I say it is a magic operation, if you do not do it correctly, you can kill the person. You can create disaster in craniovertebral junction. You can create a complication, which is most dangerous complication in our subject. You can have a person who is quadriplegic and fully conscious. So that kind of complications you do not want in your, in your curriculum. You do not want those complications in craniovertebral junction. Craniovertebral junction should be understood completely and clearly. You cannot do craniovertebral junction surgery without proper understanding the, understanding the physiology and pathology of the area. You cannot try craniovertebral junction surgery because the complications are so huge. Complications are so intense and dangerous that you do not want to have a complication at your hand. Because these patients, if you have a complication, they will kill you. They will, they will make your life miserable. So you don't do all those things without complete understanding. Technology can help, but more than that, you have to really, really have a knack of this situation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Carlos Arias has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first, congratulations, Dr. Goel, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to, to make just uh, two questions. The first one about your cages on C1, C2 joint. Uh, how was the fusion with the cage in the future? And the second uh, question is about the, this cage in, in the subaxial uh, cervical spine. Uh, uh, this device is 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 able to to make a ligamental taxis and fixation and descompression indirect descompression too. But do you think that this uh, device uh, has a little power of make kyphosis in the cervical spine? It may be necessary to make a. Uh, 316 degrees uh, procedure, maybe with uh, anterior cages to improve lordosis and avoid uh, kyphosis to, to gain the uh, sagittal alignment. This is the question. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Carlos, for that question. And I have to tell you that we introduced C1, C2 screws about 20 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago. Uh, cages, C1, C2 cages. And then we introduced subaxial cages about 15 years ago. But I have to tell you that I think that cages are remarkable, wonderful, wonderful asset for you during surgery. But my, I have reduced my use of cages over the years. For C1, C2 screw, uh, for C1, C2, I very rarely use cages. For subaxial spine, I use very rarely cages. So I used to do cages, but I don't use cages on a regular basis now. I use transarticular fixation. My concept is instability is the issue, stabilization is the solution. Cages are a wonderful form of stabilization. And I am not really sure because this question about kyphosis following introduction of cervical cages has been answered in my article. If you read my article in 2011 in Journal of Neurosurgery, I have talked about kyphotic issues in introduction of the cages, but I don't really think kyphosis is an issue and kyphosis should be worried about. It should, more important is firm, solid stabilization and aim to achieve bony arthrodesis, bone. You should actually have bony fusion that is more important than any form of cages. So for C1, C2, I told you three points. Open the joint, remove the cartilage, introduce bone graft in the articulation. I did not talk about introduction of cages in the articulation. Did you, do you agree with that? I didn't talk about cages. I talked three things. Open the joint, remove the cartilage, introduce bone graft, and then do fixation. That is my strategy. And that strategy, which we described in 1988, still remains about craniovertebral junction. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Atul, oh, Professor Victor Hugo, please go ahead. 
Professor Atul Gold, uh, this is really impressive, really, really impressive. The discarnation and the result with only arthrodesis. This yes. uh, another one. This is not only impressive, this is magic result. Thank really, you, really, you. Professor Atul Gold. Uh, sure. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Victor. I want you know the participants, many of them are young participants to read my articles on the subject where there is many, lot of more information which is there because you know, in my time, I have tried to introduce several things at one time, but you cannot talk about the entire subject. There are several small points in my articles which you will like to read and which you will like to go through. Thank you. We have the presence of Professor Takashi Kun. Maybe he would like to talk us about how are these uh, diseases uh, treated in Japan. Please, Dr. Takashi. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Dr. Takashi Kun from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, thank you. Uh, for inviting me, Dr. Jorge Salazar. Um, uh, thank you for the lecture of Arthur, Dr. Arthur Guerre. So I uh, was very impressive. I listened to your lecture several times and very impressive and reviewing uh, several papers, but too many papers to review, but very informative so lecture. So I uh, study, I keep studying um, the learning. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Takashi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Takashi. I can uh, well, I take, guess... uh, take this opportunity to thank my dear friend, John, John Bennett, who is the, uh, you know, who has taken this webinar course to teach neurosurgery to all the continents in all corners of the world using the internet, particularly during the COVID times when we were not able to personally go here and there. And I have, generated so many fr friends all over the world because of his, uh, this neurosurgical TV, which he has uh, introduced and popularized. And I can only thank John for, you know, giving me a friend like Victor, only through internet, a friend like George, only through internet. We have not met, we have not met personally, but we are so close to each other during these years. So I have to thank you, my dear John. He has made me king of king of web and king of Zoom. So thank you, John, for your- You're welcome, uh, Atul. And I'd like to make an announcement. We're gonna have, a, I think, a Q and A session. Hopefully I'm gonna get a tool to do a Q and A for the world, essentially, because obviously it's a pent up demand for answers. Uh, speaking of that, Omar just texted his question he couldn't answer, ask. For cervical disc prolapse and spastic walk, can we do facet fixation or do the decompression? No decompression. Don't talk of decompression. Don't talk of compression. Don't talk of decompression. Omar. Okay, I, I, I with you. But I asking for acute for spastic. We can wait. Yes, Passing of course. One. Of okay. course. Thank you. Thank of you. course. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I guess it has been a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, lecture. Of course, revolutionary concepts that we all uh, hope that we are we start like uh, making our own procedures and comparing with your excellent results. It will take a lot of time because of your vast experience, but you know you are a guidance for for all of us, and we hope that we could. And we will try your concepts, and you know uh, if we see how your patients are evolving and these new concepts are the way to go, we are going to follow. So I thank you very much, Professor, for uh, sharing your experience with us, with the world, with the uh, Equadron Society of Neurosurgery. Uh, I, uh, of course, want to thank Professor John Bent, as you already told us, he has helped uh, a lot uh, to this society. He also will have his time for us and uh, all the support that he gave us, uh, the same with the uh, with a SOPEN, with a, a Peruvian Society of Neurosurgery, a, a, of, a, of, of Students of Neurosurgery. And of course, I would like to thank the Academic and Scientific a, Committee of the Peruvian Society of Neurosurgery for these organizations 
uh, of these webinars with a uh, hatch uh, with such a level of high um, neurosurgeons presence like Professor Victor Pere Perez, Igor, and so many others that we can only thank for being here uh, on this Sunday. And of course, we'll have another time for, for all your the other topics, Professor Atul. And thank you very much. I would like to thank also the International University of Ecuador and the Metropolitan Hospital. And um, just say good night to you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you very much for this nice time, and we will see each other in Colombia. Okay. Bye, -bye. Okay, thank, bye bye. Thanks, bye, -bye. Everybody. bye, -bye. thanks everybody. Stay bye -bye. tuned for our tools Q and A. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.